Oh, good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, I would like the organizing committee to uh, would like to thank them for the invitation, which I really truly appreciate. I was at a softbox meeting about three or four years ago. I think we all experienced this pre-pandemic uh, blur that we don't really know how long ago it was. But uh, I remember us meeting here in uh, in Orlando, in, and we could fit into a small section of a restaurant. Uh, I don't think that works like that anymore. <laughs> uh, so we definitely have, you know, you guys had were forced to move to a larger venue. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here and talk about hypophosphatasia. And uh, my, my task is to talk about the adult uh, presentations and the adult uh, complications. Uh, it's going to be almost inevitable that I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the disease in general. Uh, you know, and of course, uh, I don't want to make you feel that Dr. Gottesman didn't do a good job and that I'm going to do it over. Uh, but, you know, it, it's just part of a, of, a, of a talk. And also, I think a, a, a bit of a repetition is probably not a bad thing. Uh, and if I feel that, uh, that I'm going to slow, then I can speed up a little bit because Dr. Gottesman already eloquently covered most of it, you know. Uh, and then we'll go and we'll segue into the adult uh, uh, presentations. So hypophosphatasia is an inborn error of metabolism. Um, as Dr. Gottesman also said, it has a highly variable clinical severity. I would say with the infantile and childhood presentation, uh, it is clearly very obvious that something is amiss with uh, those children and infants. And the question really is, what is the underlying condition that causes these problems? In adults, it is a much more problematic thing. A lot of patients with adult uh, hypophosphatasia were completely unaware for many years that they had anything wrong with them. Um, and, uh, and therefore, kind of the diagnostic process uh, is much more difficult. Typically, uh, you know, physical findings are more, more subtle or are absent. Uh, and, of course, that also then leads to a somewhat um, longer delay between uh, the, the onset of symptoms and the diagnosis. We, we, we call that the diagnostic odyssey in, in genetics, which is kind of the time that it takes from patients developing problems and seeking medical care for this, trying to figure out what's wrong with, with them, until the time that a diagnosis is made. And I think there is some evidence in hypophosphatasia in adults that that may take between 10 and 15 years. So that is disturbingly long. And, uh, and of course, you know, uh, activities like these, uh, uh, you know, of course, uh, in part aim to lower the diagnostic odyssey length. So the, the disease is associated with uh, a mutation uh, or mutations in the gene ALPL the alkaline phosphatase uh, gene, and ALPL is the gene that encodes the enzyme tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase, and just like Dr. Gottesman, I typically go by TNS ALP. So that's the enzyme, and the gene is ALPL. So it is characterized by defective mineralization of bone and or teeth, and it is typically seen in the presence of low activity of serum and bone alkaline phosphatase. So this is stuff that we all know. The prevalence of the milder forms is unclear. Uh, some estimates, so the milder forms, which I would say the adult typically, um, is, is much higher than the infantile forms. You know, the one in 300,000 that is quoted, uh, those are the children that are born with significant problems, and that is a relatively rare, uh, rare event. And, in part is due to the fact that that is a recessive condition, so you need mutations from both parents to be passed on to the child. Well, in the case of the typical adult uh, uh, hypophosphatasia, there is one mutation needed to cause the disease, so that, freak, that, that is typically more frequent. So there are some estimations, uh, estimates from the literature that say it's somewhere between 1 in 1,500 and 1 in 5,000. But given the fact that this is highly underdiagnosed, it may actually be, be much higher. And there are some population studies that suggest indeed that the, about 1 in 500 people have a mutation in uh, the ALPL gene, which has the potential at least to cause uh, hypophosphatasia. I, again, it's probably not so that everybody with 
a mutation in AOPL qualifies for a diagnosis for hyperphosphatasia, but certainly that would be one of the criteria that you would use. So when you focus on the adults, obviously there are adults with childhood onset hyperphosphatasia, um, you know, and of course they have struggled with the disease for many years, and of course in a way uh, the last seven years have been easier because of the advent of Strensic, but of course if you have lived a long life with a chronic disease, seven years does make a dent in that, but it doesn't completely eradicate the, 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 the vagaries of this disease. Um, Sometimes also ch uh, childhood onset disease is not diagnosed in that age and sometimes it, it only, you know, because of the, the delay in diagnosis, sometimes there are adults by the time they get diagnosed but they had childhood onset disease, even though at that time it was relatively subtle, possibly. And then there are adults who basically had very little, you know, if you talk to them, uh, when you diagnose an adult in his, his or her 30s or 40s with hyperphosphatasia, we typically take a medical history. And of course, you know, the patients may not remember if they had tooth loss at age two, that typically would be derived from their parents, so we may not know those details. But if you ask them how they were when they were children and adolescents, they actually tell you often that they went through life relatively normal without any uh, real concerns for their health. And then they be develop uh, problems, uh, you know, in, in adulthood, uh, early adulthood, later adulthood, and it's often associated with stress fractures and pseudo uh, fractures, typically in the, in the lower extremities. Uh, and then oc occasionally it's also seen in association with loss of adult dentition. And then there is the odontal hypophosphatasia, and I'm not talking all that much about it. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Gottesman covered it well. So the typical type of adult um, hypophosphatasia is uh, dominantly inherited. Um, so uh, I'll show you the, the kind of the cartoon again uh, uh, that Dr. Gottesman showed as well uh, at the, in the next slide. But this means that typically an affected individual has, um, um, has inherited a variant, a pathogenic variant from one of his or her parents. And then if that individual with hypophosphatasia has children, there is a 50% chance of passing that on to any child. And it's, it's not like chance looks back. So if you have a child who has hypophosphatasia, then the next child is not gonna have, is, is not gonna be uh, not at risk for hypophosphatasia. The same thing applies again, it's a 50% risk. So it's like flipping a coin and then you flip a coin again, you can have tails twice, you can have heads twice, any permutation is possible. So that means that each time the 50% risk applies. So a dominantly inherited condition, uh, as I mentioned, is typically inherited from an affected parent. I'm trying to figure out the same thing Dr. Gottesman had to figure out. Ah, there it is, so this is an affected parent uh, and there is no uh, gender predilection, so that means you, get, you can get it from your father, you can get it from your mother, and affected individuals can be males or females. Um, so this is an example. So here this male um, has hypophosphatasia and has a mutation in the gene ALPL, has four children, two of those were affected, uh, and then of those affected individuals, they of course have the mutation so they can pass it on and they happen to pass it on to all of their children, but that again is, 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 is a chance factor. And then of course, if you don't, if you were lucky enough to not get this mutation, of course it's also impossible to pass it on. Um, so typically, when we diagnose an individual with uh, hyperphosphatasia due to one mutation in ALPL, we typically know that that person is not gonna be the only one in the family with this. Uh, now the others may have different type disease, they may be less affected, they may even be more affected, uh, but they certainly, we certainly, we know that if we find one person with a mutation in ALPL, that we're gonna find more. And of course that is, in genetics, we, we know that genetics is a family sport, so we know that, and, and, and we're good at that, but of course if you fall in the hands of an endocrinologist or somebody else who works you up, they may not be such, they may not have the same awareness of this being a genetic condition and that other family members may be at risk as well. Or, uh, so certainly I think that is kind of unique to the genetic specialty that we typically find a way to test other family members as well. So for example, if you identify, um, uh, 
this person as having hypophosphatasia, the next step would be to test the parents to see uh, from which parents um, has low alkaline phosphatase or which parent has the mutation in ALPL. And then we know it is from the mother, then we know that we don't have to pursue relatives on the father's side of the family, but that we would have to look at the mother's side of the family. So that's kind of how it works. We kind of you know, work our way through the family, up and down the family tree. So other clinical features may, uh, of hyperphosphatasia may include hypercalcemia, that's an elevated calcium in the blood, and, hypercal or hyper and or hypercalciuria, an elevated calcium in the urine. As I mentioned, stress and pathological fractures and bone pain are often seen. I think the bone pain is, should, should really be mentioned strongly. Uh, some patients do not experience fractures, but they do have bone pain. Uh, and often uh, they kind of, individuals underestimate their bone pain because I, I guess if, when you have chronic bone pain, uh, I, guess when, I, guess, I guess you get used to it and you may not report it as much. But I have, I've spoken to many patients who are on strand, or Strensic that now that they say now all of a sudden I know that I was in pain in the past, but never realized it to the extent that I know now. Uh, of course, pain is a subjective, uh, you know, a, a thing. So it's it's hard to communicate about pain, especially when it's in the past. But you know, I think when too many patients tell you that story, it, it's probably true. You know, so I think bone pain is under highlighted, it's underappreciated, um, and and, uh, and 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 I guess you can get used to it to some degree. Uh, then patients may have uh, premature loss of their baby teeth, they may have severe dental caries or early loss uh, of adult teeth, and then of course there may be a, a family history of hypophosphatasia. So those are the other features that, that we try to elicit. Now what is alkaline phosphatase, and I'll go over that very briefly, uh, it's, an, uh, it's, there are, uh, it's a tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase, it contains, uh, it contains if for its activity to be optimal, it needs two, two metal ions. It needs zinc and it needs magnesium. And that is extremely important. In the absence of magnesium and zinc, alkaline phosphatase doesn't really work very well. It's not just important in terms of its activity, but also in the confirmation of the 3D structure of the, of the enzyme. So that means if zinc and magnesium are not there uh, in, in abundance, then sometimes the alkaline phosphatase enzyme doesn't take up its 3D structure and doesn't work very well, even if you then later uh, replenish with zinc and magnesium. So it, it represents the tissue nonspecific form. It's, it's as, as, as Dr. Gottesma mentioned, it's expressed in many different tissues and it's encoded by a gene on chromosome one. Now, there is still a lot that we don't know about the function of alkaline phosphatase. There probably are more, there are other functions that are currently still underappreciated and understudied. The most important thing uh, that we likely, and Dr. Gottesman talked about that as well, the fact that alkaline phosphatase removes a phosphate group from different mole molecules, uh, and especially in pyrophosphate, that seems to be the biggest problem in causing bone problems. So pyrophosphate uh, inhibits mineralization of bone and alkaline phosphatase cuts the uh, pyrophosphate in two. And once that is done, there is no more pyrophosphate and mineralization is not impeded. So that is what we know, um, but there are probably other effects of uh, alkaline phosphatase activity that affect other tissues uh, uh, and are important as well. So I think, I think research uh, possibly in the future will, um, will lead to a better understanding of the complexities of alkaline phosphatase. And currently our awareness focuses very much on the bone health problems that people with hypophosphatasia have. Now, Dr. Gottesman also gave you a list of other reasons why alkaline phosphatase uh, can be low. I, uh, a couple of years ago, I did an uh, Alexion-sponsored study that at my uh, previous uh, institution, uh, Oklahoma University Health Sciences Center, and we, we got permission to download all the alkaline phosphatases that the hospital uh, had done in the last 10 years, and I think there were like 400,000 alkaline phosphatase measurements. 
So you can imagine the size of the spreadsheet that I got. And, uh, but of course, the, the easiest thing to do was, uh, you know, uh, sort the uh, sort those 400,000 entries by the alkaline phosphatase activity, and I focused on the lowest alkaline phosphatases. I think I went through like 100 patient charts to figure out if I could find a clue why their alkaline phosphatase was so low. And I'm sure I picked up a few patients with hypophosphatasia, but the majority of patients actually had a couple of low alkaline phosphatase measurements, but then outside of uh, you know, but there were also entries where the alkaline phosphatase was normal. So obviously that would not be expected to be hypophosphatasia because if you have hypophosphatasia, alkaline phosphatase is essentially always low. Uh, it's very unusual for a person with hypophosphatasia to have fluctuating alkaline phosphatase levels, except of course when you're on Strensic, then it's very high. So. Um, so what I noticed, a lot of patients were diagnosed with lupus or other autoimmune diseases, and I'm not sure if they had low alkaline phosphatase because of the autoimmune disease or because of the treatment, therefore, uh, but it was definitely a large group. Other patients were diagnosed with cancer and were on therapy for leukemia or other forms of cancer, and again, I'm not sure if the cause of the low alkaline phosphatase was the chemotherapy that they received or their disease. I would bet you it's probably the chemotherapy. So there are agents that certainly can lower the alkaline phosphatase. And of course, if you do a thought experiment, if you put blood in a tube and you boil it, and then you measure alkaline phosphatase activity, obviously it's gonna be zero. So that means anything that happens in transport and handling of the specimen will lead to a decrease in the activity, not to an increase in the activity. When you kill it, it's not gonna have more activity, it's gonna have less activity. But with hypophosphatasia, of course, we're looking for low, uh, low activity levels, so that means um, there are many reasons why an alkaline phosphatase can be low in the lab that has nothing to do with the patient, but it's just to do with the handling of the specimen. Uh, and that is why I typically say, and I will get to that later, you shouldn't go by with one alkaline phosphatase that is low. You know, in patients with hypophosphatasia, you would expect the alkaline phosphatase to be chronically low, and you can do several measurements of it. It's a cheap test. And if it sustain, shows sustained low alkaline phosphatase activities, that gives you more uh, confidence in the, in the quality of the result. But obviously, if you have low zinc or magnesium levels, the alkaline phosphatase doesn't uh, give you low levels of activity because I just explained to you the alkaline phosphatase enzyme needs zinc and magnesium to work. So actually, sometimes doctors use the alkaline phosphatase activity as a measurement of somebody having zinc, uh, zinc deficiency. It's a very sen sensitive, uh, assay to actually determine if somebody is zinc deficient and it's very difficult to measure zinc deficiency otherwise in the lab. So um, malnutrition can also cause a low alkaline phosphatase activity, B12 deficiency, vitamin C deficiency, hypothyroidism. Then there are a couple of genetic disorders like Wilson disease and cleidocranial dysplasia that are also associated with low alkphos. And then, as I mentioned, treatment for malignancies or autoimmune diseases seems to be also be able to do that. So certainly, if you have a low alkaline phosphatase, that does not equal that you have hypophosphatasia. It's very important to understand that. So that means the alkaline phosphatase should be chronically low. Oops. So adult hypophosphatasia often presents during middle age. Um, and then, as I mentioned, sometimes patients recall shedding or their, or their mother remembers shedding of baby teeth, uh, history of rickets, loss of adult dentition is relatively common. Most commonly, I would say, in my experience, we see uh, recurrent metatarsal stress fractures, poor healing tendency, uh, then uh, subsequent high hip or thigh discomfort may be uh, suggesting, and then the identification on x-rays of uh, uh, pseudo fractures. Uh, and then, of course, they can also develop significant joint pain and possibly also muscle weakness. So that can be quite debilitating, even though uh, typically in, in, in childhood and adolescence, these patients work quite well. So it has been diagnosed for, seven, for over 70 years as having low alkaline phosphatase activity. And again, I would only, can only echo Dr. Gottesman, the diagnosis is a clinical one. It's better done by a person who knows what he or she is doing, has seen many cases before, has a wealth of experience, and can put the whole picture together. Because all these, uh, you know, the, the, the diagnosis is not made by an, an alkaline phosphatase level. It's not made by having a fracture. It's not made by having a change in ALPL. All these things help in the evaluation, but does, but does not make a diagnosis. Um, 
the degree of hypophosphatasia um, and the, 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 the substrate levels of, um, of TNS ALP, for example, PLP, generally reflects the severity of HPP. So the lower the alkaline phosphatase level is, or the higher the, say, the PLP level is, the more severe typically, in general, the disease is. But of course, uh, I, I can only echo Dr. Gottesma. We have seen many patients, uh, as I mentioned, in one family, when you identify one person in the family, there are others as well, and we find them. And there is a wide variety of levels of severity between these individuals, even though they have the same genetic underpinnings. So what exactly causes this wide variety, even with what, what should on paper be the same disease? I don't think that we understand it particularly well. Um, we often say that one gene does not live by itself. There are 23,000 other genes that play a role as well. But essentially, that is a cop-out, because essentially what we should say, we don't understand it, and it probably needs more work, you know? So the ref it's also important that there are reference ranges uh, uh, for ALP. And I think that is a very important thing, because not every hospital and every laboratory, especially local hospitals, don't, don't always adhere by that. Typically, alkaline phosphatase, in my experience, is done by laboratories buying a kit, and then they set up this kit, and they often, uh, and then every time you get a new kit, there are different reference ranges uh, for what is considered normal for a certain age of the patient. So this can vary quite wide, wildly. So for example, a younger patient, a younger person has a higher alkaline phosphatase activity than an older person, and it changes significantly with time. There's also differences between men and women. So that means a low alkaline phosphatase is only low if you fall below the reference range for that age and gender. Uh, and that is not always particularly well understood. So that means if patients tell, tell you, oh, my alkaline phosphatase level is 30, then that doesn't mean much to me because we need to know what for that particular test, what the reference range was that's considered normal. Uh, and that is why we always insist on trying to get records because these records uh, you know, provide much more objective proof of what the situation is. So, HP, so hypophosphatasia can be diagnosed without having genetic testing. Obviously, the first papers of 70 years ago, we didn't even know the ALPL gene at that time, and it is certainly not, it's certainly correct that those patients have had hypophosphatasia. Um, but it certainly has helped our understanding. We can find more of what we call clinical and biochemical and molecular um, uh, alignment between, and it also helps to confirm a diagnosis because, again, a low alkaline phosphatase by itself doesn't really mean anything. So, um, so it also allows us to test other family members, at least for the predisposition to hy uh, hypophosphatasia, and it allows us to, uh, to, to explain the recurrence risk to patients if we know that it is caused by one mutation in the gene or two mutations in this gene. So the, the, uh, I think Dr. Gottesman said that there were now 400 distinct mutations. I guess I, I'm, I'm at 330. I guess I need to update, need to update this. <laughs> Uh, but, but clearly, you know, if, you, if we're going to talk again in, in two or three years, there's probably going to five, it's going to be 500 mutations. So, so our understanding about what, what, uh, what a, a change in the gene is. So the word mutation typically in patient language means it's bad, correct? We, we typically speak about variants. So, so there are lots of variants in the gene, but not every variant is associated with disease. That could just be completely benign and not cause any problems in the patient. So the fact that you, again, have a change in ALPL does not make hypophosphatasia diagnosis either. So again, it's a combination of different lines of evidence that allows us to make such a diagnosis. So in summary, um, to make a diagnosis, one needs to have symptoms that would bring a patient to the doctor. And then in terms of the biochemical workup, a low alkaline phosphatase is crucial, and I would say we need it at least twice. You know, it at least it, it kind of rules out the fact that nothing m was messed up with the first sample, that it is, if you do a second sample a couple of months later, it gives you the same result. That's certainly reassuring that it's real. Um, typically, high PLP levels are found, and then with ALP, ALPL sequencing, 
you would hope to identify a pathogenic or a likely pathogenic variant. And if you have those findings together with the clinical phenotype, I think that makes a secure diagnosis. Now, the biochemical measurements are also very important that they are done before somebody is started on Strensic. Um, I, I cannot stress that enough. I have lots of patients who are referred to my office and come from a, another doctor in, in, in Florida somewhere, and they come in with paperwork and uh, tell me that they have been diagnosed with hypophosphatasia and want me to take over the care and continue Strensic and then ask them for the records, and then there are, there's no documentation of alkaline phosphatase. I, the only alkaline phosphatase that I have is one that is 8,000, and that is, of course, obtained from when the patient was put on Strensic. And then, of course, the alkaline phosphatase doesn't mean anything anymore. And the same applies also to the PLP. The PLP changes significantly once you're put on Strensic. So that means if you lose out on the biochemical parameters, you cannot get them back afterwards. The genetic testing can still be done, so that, that's certainly helpful. X-rays can still be done, or you can review all the X-rays. But if there are no low alkaline phosphatase documented before Strensic was started, I think that is a real omission and it should really be avoided. You know? And of course, I am often at the receiving end when somebody is already on Strensic. You know, it's a difficult conversation to have with a patient. Well, I need to take you off Strensic for three months and then I have to measure your alkaline phosphatase and then we restart it. I mean, patients are not interested in that. Uh, but that also means that the ship has sailed and that often then the diagnosis is more at risk of being, in, of being correct or be at risk of being incorrect. And that's a real conundrum that I find myself in quite a few times. Uh, I don't know whether you've seen that, but oh, uh, yeah. So, and of course the patient is at the mercy of what their doctors tell them, so they go on Strensic, they don't know necessarily. And I think that's where soft bones can really uh, help the patients out when they reach out to you uh, before they start Strensic, that they kind of, one of the guidance would be, you know, make sure that all the the boxes are ticked before you go on Strensic. So I want to give you an example of a patient. I'm, if, if I'm, I'm already reaching uh, the, the bottom of the hour, so uh, you're good. You're good? So, uh, so this is a, 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 a real example. Um, of course, I, I, I changed the details a little bit to protect the innocent, but. Um, a 40-year-old female, relatively well for most of her life, no fractures in her history, no issues in childhood and adolescence. She took up running after her three children became school-aged, and then a few, few months into her running, uh, uh, she developed pain in her feet and was eventually diagnosed with bilateral metatarsal stress fractures. She stopped running for a while because of the pain and to give the bones a rest, felt that she had healed, and then took up running again, and then the same started again. Um, again, new stress fractures were uh, identified, and these fractures now took longer to heal. Pain slowly went away, so the patient reviewed some of the labs her doctors had ordered during these last three years and noticed that her alkaline phosphatase was tested three times and it was always low. The first time it was 18, the second time it was 21, and the third time it was 19. And normal for females over 17 by using this kit was 34 to 104. So it's well below 35. It's three times normal. Uh, so the, asked the doctors what, if this would be uh, meaningful uh, to her uh, recurrent stress fractures, and her doctors said that there was no relationship and they dismissed it as a possibility. And of course, you know, you guys have probably all gone that, gone through that. If you Google low alkaline phosphatase, it's one of the first hits that you find out on of hyperphosphatasia. So patients can do the job themselves. And it's kind of interesting how come doctors never Google. You know? <laughs> uh, but uh, but she, that she, found, she, she went online, found that hyperphosphatasia is associated with low ILP and also with these stress fractures potentially. And she asked her doctor to order a PLP, which then came back as high. And then she prompted her doctor to kind of order genetic testing, which I guess the doctor eventually managed to figure out how to do it. Uh, and, and, and that patient was then found to have a known pathogenic mutation in ALPL. So essentially the patient chaperoned her doctor through the diagnostic process. And, and, and uh, that is an, an observation that we make more and more, certainly in the adult uh, people. You know, people are smart, they, they're very motivated to figure it out. Doctors only have 10 minutes of their time for you, so if they don't know what it is, they're not going to look it up, obviously. It's, it looks like it. And, um, 
you know, and, and if you're motivated, you can get quite far. It's a shame that it has to be like that, but of course, uh, it, it, it happens, you know. So then she came to me for a consultation, and she obviously fulfilled the, the diagnostic criteria for adult uh, onset HPP. And I guess uh, at that time, I felt the ship had sailed. This lady is so smart and interested, she's going to be wanting to start on Strensic. And then, of course, she, she was actually quite thoughtful about it because I wasn't necessarily convinced that this would make a huge difference, although it probably would make a difference if you were to be on this for a long time, that it would reduce the frequency of stress fractures. Also, of course, women struggle with osteoporosis, typically postmenopausal, and then you have double whammies. So basically, maybe it's a good thing to start on Strensic so that you kind of set yourself up for a decent bone health when those ages arrive. Um, but of course, you have to balance that against the need for, you know, regular injections and all the stuff that comes with that. And in the end, she opted to for, for, uh, to, you know, for attempts to optimize her bone bone health, to modify her disease, uh, her exercise routine, uh, and she deferred the decision to start on Strensic until a couple of years later. And then we decided that we would have a conversation again. And then, of course, we also made a plan to identify other family members because, again, typically what we do in genetics is certainly that we know that there is probably more people out there who may or may not have hypophosphatasia and probably, uh, you know, may follow in the same path towards decision making if they are affected. So, so she decided against Trensic. So this, this leads us quickly into Trensic, and I'm not going to um, uh, I, I think we can skip that. I can just do this uh, speaking. So if you are on an expensive medication and this medication is supposed to help you with the disease, meaning make the disease better, um, I think at a minimum you want to know, is the therapy helping me? You know, and of course, one of the things that can help that if, that if, you, don't, if you don't have any more fractures, that certainly makes a difference. You can also feel better, have less bone pain. But these are rather subjective measures. I mean, they're not, they're not unimportant. They're probably the most important uh, aspects of uh, patient care because the patient wants to feel better. That's the incentive and have less fractures. But on the other hand, doctors typically want some other more objective measures to see if the patient is benefiting from the treatment as they would hope. And I think that is currently the challenge. You know, bone, bone density testing is not necessarily the best measure of uh, efficacy. Um, to measure the alkaline phosphatase is pointless because the alkaline phosphatase is going to be 8,000. I think the struggle is currently, you know, where do we, how do we measure that the patients are benefiting and how can we tweak the therapy if the patients are not benefiting to the extent that they would want. And I, I, I think I...